All right, good. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so, yeah, so we'll jump straight in. So uh, here's the title. So we're going to learn to love writing peer reviews. Um, we're going to find out how not to be reviewer two. And we'll, we'll, we'll meet reviewer two as we go along. Um, I'm going to be reviewer three. Um, and um, so this is so this will be the beginning of um, or the, the first of what might be a little sort of mini series of talks about the whole sort of publication process. Um, but I think that the one aspect of it, which I think is, is is actually very rarely talked about, is this one, and that's the process of how you actually set about reviewing papers. So we'll start with this, um, and then a couple of weeks' time, um, we'll do another one, which will be about how you respond to reviews. So when your your precious paper comes back, being after being mauled by reviewer two and reviewer three, um, what you actually do and how you handle it. Um, so um, so we'll start with, with 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 this little story. Here's Albert. It's always good to start with Albert. Um, and um, Albert only ever had one brush with peer review in his entire career. They didn't really go in for it much in his day. Um, he didn't like it much. So um, there's, there's a quote from him. He, he sent a paper off to a journal. They sent it out to an expert. He was very upset. Um, and that's what he said. We, we, I sent you our manuscript for publication. Had not authorized you to show it to specialists before it was printed. I see no reason to address the, in case, erroneous comments of your anonymous expert. So. Um, so it's actually they're starting a, a, a proud tradition of responding to review. Um, and um, but um, anyway, things have things have changed a bit since Albert's day, um, and uh, we now live in a world where peer review is is is, is, is quite rightly part of our part of our daily lives. Um, so I thought let, let's let's just take a look at some of the sort of the motivation and reasons for doing it. Why what, why do we do peer reviews? Well. It, it, it's it's part of our responsibility as members of communities of scientists. That's, that's basically how it works. Um, and um, I think a good way to look at it is that for for every for, for every paper that appears in the literature, um, there's, there's there's an average of probably something like three reviews. It might be more than that if you take into account all the papers that go to review and never get published. There's certainly at least three reviews for every published paper. So. Um, what that means is that if you're submitting two papers a year to journals, then you should be reviewing six, because that's um, you know, that, that's just the ratio that's needed to actually um, make the system work. Um, now you, and, and what happens, of course, is you get as you publish more and you get uh, you, you get better known and your name gets around, um, then um, you start getting sent more and more requests to review, um, and um, you won't be able to do them all. So um, you then have to have some criteria to choose which ones you can do. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well as we go. Um, so um, some of the other reasons for doing it. Well, firstly, it's actually a, a really useful, beneficial experience for yourself as well as for the, the author of the paper. You're bound to learn something. Um, and um, if you're not learning anything from the science, well, A, you should probably reject the paper. Um, but um, it, 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 even if it's uh, not necessarily that great a paper, you're going to learn something. And it might actually be how not to write a paper. It might be you know, how, to, how, to, how to avoid making some of the mistakes that you identify as a reviewer. Um, and the other way of looking at it, it's a great workout um, for your scientific thinking muscles. It's, it's probably the, I, I think in my experience, the only time I ever actually really properly critically read a paper is when I'm reviewing it. Um, unless it's something which is really just sort of like absolutely central to something that I'm working on, I really need to understand that. The only time I really actually come to grips, you know, line by line, detail by detail with the paper is when I'm reviewing it. Um, and that's a that, that, that's just great exercise. Um, so as I said, it, it, it'll help you write better papers. And that's that's true of however experienced you are. I think uh, that that's that's still true for me of, after you know, being in the game for you know, nearly 40 years. Um, I still learn stuff every time I review a paper. So, um, but um, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit of a bruising experience. So we've now got you know, some sympathy cards for scientists there to help us uh, help, help, help us through some of the more bruising aspects of it. Um, there, there, there's there's another aspect of the whole um, of the whole reviewing process, and that's the way it fits into the um, sort of the, the the economics of the journal publishing industry. And, I, and and that's something I might get into in another session, um, perhaps later on in this series. Um, it's it, it 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 it's truly a bizarre bit of economics the way the international public um, scientific publishing industry works, but um that's a that's a, a story for another day. Um, so um, and of course now the other reason for doing peer reviews is that basically nobody's actually at this point really thought of a better way, and there there, there are some ideas that are starting to float around in the um particularly the, the open access movement is starting to come up with some suggestions for. For other ways we might be able to do scientific peer review. Um, but for now, um, 
just simply because of the way the system works um, and the way that um, you know we, we uh, our, our, our scientific credentials are measured by publications and by citations, um, then peer review is something that we that, that is that is embedded in that. And peer review is basically the competitive advantage that the scientific publishing industry owns, um, and uh, we're all sort of complicit in that, however we like it or not. Um, but uh, you know, if, if if you have a look here, you know the the alternatives to peer review journals uh, you know, um, are, are really not that not that viable. So uh, this is the system we have, and this is uh, this is the system we live with. So um, all right, so why do them? We've covered that. Okay, so what actually is your job as a peer reviewer? Um, and there are really two two jobs, um, and this is the most important one. The most important one is to take the manuscript that's sent to you, and um, and if you can, make it better. That's really your first responsibility. It's not to, it's not actually to be peer review cat. It's actually to be a constructive, make a constructive contribution to to to, to, to publishing good science. But the other side of that, um, and this is also a really important part, it's to keep erroneous rubbish out of the literature. So um, a big part of the reason we have peer review is because we need a system of gatekeeping the literature against um, against flat out error or. or, or so, 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 so some of the other sort of um, uh, common sort of mis mistakes, errors, and and, um, and and misrepresentations that turn up in, in papers, and we're going to talk about those later. So, um, so the, you're always kind of balancing those two things. One of the, one of those is a constructive role, and the other one is a gatekeeper role. Um, so, no pressure there. So, all right. So let's just have a look at a few. So we'll start out with just some sort of general tips about how you might actually approach the whole process. So, so, uh, so the, the the first one is that um, you need to actually know a bit about the journal that you're reviewing for. So you you, refer, you, you would review papers for different journals in different ways, um, and the, and the, the the main sort of distinction is really between the sort of high impact, um, you know, sort of short uh, short punchy um, glamour journals, the sort of nature science um, type type things. Um, as opposed to um, the other end of the spectrum being the really sort of long format, high detail, intensive type type of papers, which um, you know, in, in, in my field would be something like the Journal of Petrology or Geochemica or Cos Cosmochemica Acta, um, the, 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 the really sort of long form papers where you expect to see lots of detail, and lots of justification. Um, and really the difference between those, the, the, the main difference when you're reviewing them is that um, for the sort of the high impact journals, you've got an, an, an extra decision to make. And that extra decision to make is not just, is it good science, is it worth saying, but is it, um, uh, is it something which is actually appealing well beyond its immediate field of specialty? So is this something which the scientific community as a whole should be interested in? Um, and um, and that's a really important question to answer because particularly that there, there is now so much pressure being put on on, on, on on academics and researchers to publish in these kinds of journals, um, that they are now being absolutely flooded with material, um, and it, and it's become sort of the, um, the kind of the, the the first priority is oh how are we going to get a paper into one of these glamour journals? And, it, and my my personal view is that that is actually working to the detriment of science. I think it's a really harmful thing, but um, but we're stuck with it. So. Um, so, so, so if you are getting papers from 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 some of these kinds of journals, then then you, you have to be, I think, very very hard on that question. Is this something? Is this really something? Which, if it's a paper in geoscience, is it really something which a chemist or a physicist or a, or a biologist um, might find something interesting? And in? if the answer to that is no, then they just simply don't belong in those journals. Um, okay. So there's so the second point, um, and this is really obvious, but it's sort of surprising how often it doesn't happen, and that's actually Read the damn paper. Read the whole paper. Read all of it. Um, and that uh, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to sort of like, like pr proofread the, the, the tables and the supplementary materials, but you should be at least looking at them um, and making sure that um, you know that, that the material in those tables is in a is in a useful format and is uh, accessible for people who might want to use it. Um, but uh, yeah, so so that that's if you take one thing away, then you know read the paper um, and. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about shortly. Uh, there are a couple of different ways to read the paper. All right. Now, another sort of general principle: if you're if you're if you're raising a problem with a paper, then it's your job as a reviewer not just to say there's a problem. It's your job to suggest a solution. But balance that with it's not your job to do the author's thinking for. 
you're not going to rewrite the paper. You're not reinterpreting their data. You're not formulating a hypothesis. Um, when uh, I say suggest. I guess we can start with, yeah, well, let's code them all yeah. as an add for the yeah. and then we can select later which one. Uh, uh, sorry, okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I had an interruption there. Are we okay? We're back online. Can you hear me? Sorted, Steve. Yeah, okay, good. Um, sorry, I, I'm, I'm on, um, are you having trouble hearing? No, we're okay. No, it's okay. All good. All right. Um, so as I said, so um, yeah, so so you're 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 kind of balancing those two things. Um, you you need to suggest a solution to obvious problems, and most of those things will will, will or, or very often those things will be around the clarity of the presentation of the data, or they'll they'll be around organisation, or they'll be around other things which um, you can see a way for the author to fix. Um, but um, I say, it's, but, but, but that sort of stops short of where you're actually, you know, reinterpreting the data for them, doing their thinking for them. Um, you need to be in the right frame of mind. Um, so, um, you know, you, you, you don't want to be doing reviews. It, it, I, I sort of think of it like driving, don't review drunk. Um, you, you don't want to be reviewing when, when, when you, you, your, your mind's not in the job. You need to be doing it when you're in a receptive frame of mind. Um, and you also need to be doing it ideally when you're not under time pressure. Um, so, um, and that can sometimes happen. I and mean, when we all do it, reviews kind of pile up in the inbox and we leave it till the deadline and then we're, um, and th th then we're, then we're under time pressure. And that's not really a desirable thing. So um, try not to get into that situation. And, and then the last one, and this is probably actually the real major sort of takeaway point. Um, reviewers, you would want to be reviewed. Um, you know, it, when you're reviewing somebody else's paper, um, treat it the same way you would expect somebody else to treat yours. And um, and they're just a basic sort of simple thing like respect and courtesy go a really long way. Just essentially be a decent human being as a as, as a reviewer and, and anything else. So th those are the sort of general kind of overview things. And now we'll we'll, we'll, we'll we'll do a little bit of a, a sort of a flow chart as to how you might actually set about the process. Um, so um, so here's um, everybody has a different way of doing it. Um, and um, I should say at this point and that, uh, that, that there are a few sort of online recipes. Um, I'll point you to them later on. There are a couple of resources you can look up, which really sort of go through the whole thing kind of step by step. I'm not, I, I don't want to do that because you can read it in your own time. But um, this is sort of the way I approach it. So, so the, the first thing, I think this is a really useful thing to do. When you, when, when you first get the paper, um, when you first start on the job, just, just read it through without writing anything down. Um, you might jot down a few notes to yourself, but don't start writing the review on the first read. Um, and um, this is a, it's a, I think this is a common mistake that people often make. And I, I, I've often had reviews back from on, on my own papers where I can see somebody's clearly done this. They've started writing comments um, before they've actually got to the bit of the paper where I actually answered the comment they've just raised. So, so don't do that. Read the, read the paper generally and read it as you would read it if you were just reading a journal paper. So you, you're not really going for a sort of really careful close read this time. You just you're, tr you're trying to answer these questions here. You're trying to answer. Okay, is the basic story clear? Um, does it advance the science? Did I learn anything? Um, and is there any of any sort of obvious blinding flaw in it? Is there, you know, is there anything which just is just kind of obviously wrong? Um, and um, so, so if we go through that, um, and and you haven't sort of run across any of those sort of obvious kind of killer things, then you go to or go to the second read. Um, if there's if the answer is no to more than one of those questions. Um, then you're probably going to reject the paper. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll come then to what happens if you come to that decision. So, all right, so so next thing, all right, so far so good. Um, so, sorry, back up, I'm ahead of myself. Um, so now you're going to the second read of the paper. Now this is the point where you're actually reading it closely. You're going line by line um, and you might, and, and, and here is where you actually start to write down some of your comments. Um, and I think it, it, what I find useful at this stage is not to self edit. So. Um, this is a good point where you just write down everything. Um, you're going to go back and edit it later, so it doesn't really matter what you say. This is at this point more for your benefit than the author's benefit. Um, write down all the comments as you like. There's um, there, there are a couple of schools of thought. One says the best way to do this is to actually write sticky note comments on the actual manuscript. Um, the other is to start a separate file. Um, my feeling is that it's actually more useful to you and the author if you do it on a separate file. So, um, so if you're writing comments, just note down the line number and then write the comment. And, and the reason for that is that when the author comes to review it later, 
it's actually much easier to do than it is to to then you know, have to kind of copy and paste comments off out of a PDF or whatever. But um, but that's a sort of second order thing. It's it's, it's whatever works best for you. Um, so all right, so now you've done that. You've been through the paper. You've written the all detailed comments. Um, now what what I strongly recommend at this point is that you actually leave it alone for a couple of days. Um, just sort of let it gestate, then come back to it again. Um, and now what you're going to do is you're going to go through all of those detail points. You're going to edit them. You're going to remove the bits. Where, you're going to remove the duplicates. You're going to take out the grumpy bits. We'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, and then after you've done that, um, you're going to write your, your your summary and your recommendation and, and, and your suggestions for how things might might be done better. Um, okay, so that's on the uh, that's on the sort of the positive um, side of the flowchart. Um, now, what if you've decided that really early on you can see, okay, this paper is just not going to make it. Um, what happens now? Well, again, you still need to do the second read, but you're probably going to do it a slightly different way. If you're rejecting a paper flat out, there's really no point in going through and correcting the grammar. Um, so, um, so, so what you should be doing at this point now is just writing down, okay, exactly what is wrong with it. Um, and if you can see a way of, being, of saving it, then that, 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 that's what you should be doing at this point making some suggestions for for how it how it could be how it could be retrieved and what might be and that, now, now those might be scientific suggestions it might be yeah you need to go back and make some more observations um or it might just simply be that you know it's so badly written that you can't make sense of it um hopefully you won't get papers in that state but sometimes you do um and then the other thing you need to to decide at that point is if you uh, if, if your if your re recommendation is um essentially a major you know, really major revision so um resubmit after a complete rewrite then you've got to decide if you're willing to re-review it um and you, you you can specify yes or no to that question um so um that's that's really sort of the kind of the kind of the first pass um and um yeah just just sort of a point there that one, one of the one of the most common reasons i think and this is particularly true for papers which are intended for sort of high impact journals um, question is well actually does it really matter i mean there, 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 there are an awful lot of papers that get submitted which are really just not adding very much to, to the science at all they're just maybe adding a little bit of incremental data around the edges but they, they sort of fall into this category of it doesn't matter um, which has no effect on the universe whatsoever um, and um, and those are actually often the hardest decisions to make um, where you've got a You've, you've got a paper which is actually fundamentally sound. There's nothing wrong with it. Data's okay. It's interpreted well. It's re it's it, it, it's um it, it, it's reasonably written, but it just doesn't say anything interesting. Um, and then that's really where that there's nobody can advise you on that. That's that's your judgment as to whether you think it's still still worth publishing. Um, so um, so now we've got to this bit. Um, we've, we've we've done the sort of a, we've, we've done the, the second read. We've done the third read, which is where we're actually sort of tidying up and and and, and cleaning up your points. I I would then suggest actually still leave it another day, um, and then maybe go back and iterate that point again um, fairly quickly, just just to, just to make sure. And the test you're applying now is the one down the bottom left hand of the screen. You're you're, you're looking at your own review and you're saying, is it fair? Is it constructive and is it respectful? Um, and if the answer to all of those things is yes, then then you're done um, and send it in. If, if it isn't, um, then you need to go back and iterate your, your, your third read step again. Um, so um, now decisions about when, when when it does sometimes happen, unfortunately it doesn't happen that often, but when it does happen that you have to flat reject a paper, um, what, what are the reasons for doing that? Um, under what circumstances would you actually say no? This is just a this is going nowhere. Um, and the first one is obviously if it's just bad science, um, and um, you know, nobody can advise you on that. That's something that you use your judgment to say. But if it's based, the methodology is flawed, um, this, 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 the stats are bad, the logic is bad, um, things just don't flow. Um, models that uh, um, sort of genetic models that, that, that violate the rules of physics and chemistry. Um, um, unethical behavior, obviously, if you, and this is something that um, you know, might, might not be really obvious, but it might turn up as you, as you look through the paper in more detail. Plagiarism, um, is that multiple submissions? If you, and you find out that the same thing has actually been submitted to two different places, that's a reason for flat rejection. Um, wheel reinvention, um, and th this is, this is quite a, quite a common one where somebody's publishing a paper claiming some, some massive discovery, except the problem is it's been discovered already. Um, and, um, they're not really adding adding anything new to it. Then, but that's fairly commonly a reason to flat reject the paper. Um, so, um, 
It doesn't happen often. Um, I would, I very rarely actually flat reject a paper. I, 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 I do if it's really shocking. Um, but generally, I will always try and find a way of saying, okay, this is this is what you can do to save it, um, and um, I, I make a recommendation, you know, a, a major revise, resubmit decision. I'll, I'll do that more commonly than than, 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 than in reject. If if the if the editor, the associate editor of the journal, is doing their job properly, we should never have to reject. Okay, so um, that's the uh, that's the sort of workflow aspect. Now let's talk a little bit about um, um, some of the things not to do. Um, or, well, no, sorry. Before we do that, just a couple of other things to look for. Um, and um, the, these, these these are sort of points of um, um, points of sort of common problems with papers and things to actually sort of particularly to focus on when you're critiquing a paper. And this is these are sort of useful things to bear in mind if it, it's something you, you haven't done much of this yet. You're relatively new at it. Um, then this this might be useful to you. Um, and, and one of them, you're probably aware of this. If you've ever done any any courses in um, in, in, in writing papers, um, then something like this will, uh, will will come up. But this is the the, the hourglass structure, um, and th this this is a, a pretty standard sort of template format for pretty much any kind of scientific paper. And that, that is that um, just you 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 need to start broad, narrow in to exactly what 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 the contribution of this piece of science is. And then broaden back out again to what to, to, to what it means and why people should care. So, and there are lots of different versions of this on the on, on the web. You can look them up. But that, that's a that, that's a sort of good summary. So, um, we're starting with what, what's the context? What's the problem? Why should people care? Um, what's been done before? Um, and why it is that this problem isn't solved? What bits are we actually going to tackle? Um, then into the actual nuts and bolts of what we did and what we found. Um, and then at the end, okay, given that. Um, why you should care about what we found and what the implications are. So it's kind of obvious. Um, most papers are written somewhere around about that sort of framework, but the, but but if, if it's not, it should be, and that's something that we should uh, we should be pointing out. Um, a few other more sort of subtle things. Um, one thing to look for is what are called weasel words. Um, weasel words are um, it says they're informal to words and phrases aimed at creating an impression that something specific and meaningful has been said. Um, when in fact only a vague or ambiguous claim has been communicated. Um, and the analogy, it's a, it's a really lovely analogy. A, a, a weasel is a little animal which likes to like, likes to eat eggs. And what it does is it, it, it sucks the inside out of the egg but leaves the shell intact. Um, so what it means is you've still got something that looks like an egg, but there's actually nothing in it. Um, and that's what weasel words do to, uh, do, do, do to statements. Um, and any, any time you hear any politician interviewed on TV, you can be sure that they'll be using weasel words. Um, but they also pretty commonly turn up in scientific papers. And here's a sort of a, like kind of slightly comedic version of a few of them. And I mean, you know, this is a joke, but it's quite a good one. And, and quite a lot of these things do actually turn up. You know, it's um, a promising area for an initial study. I have to do this to get funding. Um, the, um, an extensive literature review, a quick Google search. Um, we'll come to citations in a second. Um, and um, more, more research is required. Oh, that one, that's um, uh, that, that means I need more funds to, 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 to stay employed. But there's lots of those, and you get pretty good at recognizing them. Um, this is a common one, the brush under the carpet. This is the, um, the thing which didn't actually make sense, so we're burying it where you won't notice it. Um, and these are things which sometimes turn up in sort of supplementary materials or uh, you know, sort of buried away in the discussion somewhere. Um, and the, 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 the thing which potentially sort of undermines the entire argument. Um, this is a this is quite a common one, the false claim, um, and the false claim is is, is a biggie in um, you know sort of the glamour publication business. When people are trying to get something into nature or science, and they're claiming some massive significance, claiming some sort of new advance, but that that advance has actually already been made. It's not not really new at all. Um, so that that's an important one to watch out for. Um, the logical leap, um, and that's a uh, you know nicely summarised in this uh, famous Harris cartoon. Um, the, the, the miraculous jump from uh, from observation to uh, to interpretation. Um, technical flaws are obviously things that uh, you know, you're going to be looking out for. Um, and then there are a whole lot of things that are a little bit more subtle, and they, they, these are in the, these are sort of in the category of um, so sort of this the standard kind of cognitive biases. Um, and um, and the, the 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 most common one of these, um, which underpins um, pretty much all human activity, and particularly the whole sort of process of doing science. It's a confirmation bias. Um, that's favoring evidence that supports your pre-existing belief while ignoring evidence that doesn't. 
And, um, and we're all guilty of that. And um, it's almost impossible to eradicate from our lives, but it's a really important thing to look out for in papers. Um, and um, it's everywhere. Um, and um, at, at this point, just a couple of books that I'd like to recommend um, on the whole notion of, um, of cognitive biases um, and, um, and, and the way they sort of sneak unbidden into our lives. Um, and the big one is um, a book on the right there um, by Daniel Kahneman, who's a, um, actually a, a, a psychologist who won a Nobel Prize in economics. Um, it's, a, a, it's a very famous book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, it, it's, it's hard work. I still haven't actually finished it. I've been reading it for about two years. Um, but um, it, 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 it's, it's, um, the, the first part of it particularly is, is really important, um, not just for, for, for what he found, but it's also actually a fabulous description of scientific method um, and ways of actually formulating a hypothesis and, 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 and testing it and using it to develop your understanding. And if, if that one's a bit too much of a mouthful, it is pretty heavy going. Um, the other one you can read um, is um, by Michael Lewis, who wrote The Big Short, wonderful, really accessible writer. It's called The Undoing Project. Um, and it's the history of the collaboration between Daniel Kahneman and Eamon Tversky, who is his longtime collaborator. Um, and um, it's, it, 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 it's a great read, but it's also a really good exposition of actually what the sort of the main points are. Um, so if, you, if, if you're looking for some good, uh, looking for some good, really interesting reading, then, then may, maybe start with uh, start with Michael Lewis before you go to the uh, to the man himself. Uh, and if you want an exercise in humility, at some point, just look up Daniel Kahneman's Google Scholar citations, um, and it uh, puts all of us in our place. Um, okay, a few others: hammer and nail syndrome. I'll go through these a little bit quickly. Um, so, um, and this is another famous quote: "If the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail." Um, and this is something that crops up in quite a lot of um, scientific publications. And it's, it's again, it's almost inevitable. It's, um, if you're an isotope geochemist, then you're going to, uh, I don't mean to pick them out particularly, but if, you're, but, but if you are, then you're going to be writing papers on isotope geochemistry, and that's going to be um, the main tool that you use. Um, and, um, and if you're not careful, it can be the only tool that you use. So you've got to watch out for, for, for um, so, so ignoring the context, I guess, and ignoring you know what the other sort of potential lines of evidence are and how they matter. Um, this is um and the, 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 the sort of the posh name for that, and the thing you'll read about in Kahneman and Tversky is the availability heuristic, um, and that is that things that come to mind easily are the things that we think of as being more common and more important. Um, and this is, for example, the reason why, why why people freak out about flying if they've just read a newspaper article about a plane crash, um, and um and 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 so on. So um, the streetlight effect. So this is a this is a little bit the same sort of story. Um, this is a very famous cartoon from I think the 1920s, um, and here's um, here's your man looking for a look, look, looking looking for a coin that he dropped. Did you drop it here? So no, I dropped it two blocks down the street. Well, why are you looking for it here? Well, because the light's better here, um, and um, that actually describes quite a lot of scientific research. It's a really sort of common underpinning uh, sort of structural error. Um, and um, th 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 another one is the sunk cost fallacy. Um, and um, this is something which I think is actually embedded in quite a lot of publications, which is that um, we put a whole lot of money and a huge amount of work into this. Um, so, um, so even though we didn't actually find anything, we can't waste all that effort, so we've got to publish it anyway. Um, and that's sort of quite nicely summarized by the cartoon on the right. I already wrote the paper, that's why it's so hard to get the right data. Um, so um, so, so, so that, that, that's another one to be aware of. Um, and then one more, which I just put in because I love this cartoon, um, the gratuitous citation syndrome, um, which is the, the issue of people citing papers that they haven't read. Um, and I, again, I'm sure we've all done that. Um, but um, it, it, and we've probably also all had the experience of seeing somebody um, citing a paper that you've written, but citing it to say the exact opposite of what it actually said. Um, so the principle here is that if you had cited a paper, you should actually really know what you're citing it for. And, what is actually in that paper. And that's kind of obvious, but you know, a lot of these things are obvious, but people don't do them. Um, so now let's, um, let, 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 let's go on to sort of the last bit of this, which is um, how not to be the, uh, the, the, the mythical reviewer two. So reviewer two has become a bit of a sort of internet meme. Um, reviewer two is the, uh, is, is, is the, is the, the, the grumpy reviewer. Um, and uh, reviewer two has all of these, all of these attributes. So grumpy, aggressive, vague, unhelpful. Um, overbearingly committed. So, um, in other words, they're, 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 they're the hammer looking for the nail. Um, inflexible, unwilling to give benefit of the doubt. So, on all of these various things. Um, and um, if you want to, 
this, this is actually a very, very, very good article. I've given you the link to it there, and I really recommend reading it. Um, and um, and the other one I've added of my own, they're in love with their own egos. Um, and, um, and, and, and that is the sort of the classic reviewer two syndrome of, um, of recommending you know, that, that, that you cite an extra sort of 10 papers written by a, written by reviewer two, despite whether or not they're actually in this. Um, so here's another little description of reviewer two. Reviewer two is an angry and bitter scholar exacting revenge on their peers who overlook critical anonymous rejections of papers they secretly written, they'd written themselves. Um, reviewer two doesn't like copies. Don't be like reviewer two. So don't be like reviewer two. And don't be a, don't, don't be on the end of this. Um, and some ways of, of of not being reviewer two. But one of the one of the sort of classic reviewer two things, and um, this is something which you very often get. There's a suggest endless suggestions to add new stuff, complicate the uh, complicate the argument, and put in a whole lot of extra stuff, um, cite a lot more review two papers, while simultaneously requesting that the length of the paper be reduced by thirty percent. That actually really doesn't help. So, um, so if you are going to say the paper's too long, um, and then you're suggesting that something else be added to it, then um, it's your responsibility to suggest what should be taken out to make room for it. Um, this is. I just threw this one in because this is a, a review which I just got on one of my papers, and I think it, it, it's a just a classic example of a bit of sort of not really overt but sort of subtle reviewer twoism. Um, and there's a couple of quotes there. For any exploration of other mechanisms noted below that I find intriguing is absent. Um, and then the second quote there, which is fun, it's quite incredible. Anybody would actually write that in a review. Um, um, but uh, yeah, there it is. Don't write stuff like that. It's obvious that you shouldn't write stuff like that, but it's amazing that people do. Um, but the, sort of the, 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 the broader opinion really is, um, or the broader sort of principle is that um, a lot of the stuff that you might write in a review um, is essentially really just a matter of opinion. And, uh, and, and, and this is really sort of quite a difficult one. Um, if, if, if somebody's writing, if somebody's basically proposing a model, proposing a mechanism, proposing an interpretation, um, that you don't happen to agree with, um, then you've got to look at that really hard and say, well, do I not agree with it just because it's my opinion? Um, or do I not agree with it because there's something fundamentally wrong with the way they've got there? Um, and, and very often you'll find if you really sort of examine it and think hard about it, it's actually just your opinion. Um, and, and, and my take on that is that your opinion doesn't matter. Um, but people are entitled to interpret their data and interpret their science however they want to. As long as they're doing it without violating, you know, some of the principles we talked about earlier, they're not—they're not disobeying the laws of physics or chemistry. Um, their interpretation is reasonable. It's just, it's just something that, for whatever reason, you might not happen to agree with. Well, it's not your job then to to to, to stop people expressing um, that, that that interpretation. Um, so um, we'll just throw that. That's a nice little sort of topical cartoon I found uh, in the course of looking for review of two means. I thought it was rather nice. Um, so um, we're, we're sort of close, close to the end of this now. Um, oh, just a, a couple of other things I found in the course of, uh, you know, sort of looking, for, looking for content for this. I thought this one was rather wonderful. This, this is actually a real paper. Um, it's not even in the Journal of Irreproducible Results, but it's really rather, really rather wonderful. So, um, um, and uh, here's, another, here's another little bit of a review of a review or two turned up on a, a web search. So, okay, so here are some resources that you might want to follow. Um, the one I previously mentioned uh, from A.M. Brown, um, which is basically how not to be a reviewer to. Um, and, the one, and, the, and the first one there, that's on the Wiley Journal website. Um, and that's a, a step-by-step -step recipe for how you might go through um, doing a peer review. It's a bit, a bit more prescriptive than you might want, but, uh, but, but, but still there's a lot of useful stuff in it and it's well worth reading. Um, so, um, and I think, uh, you know, now's the, uh, Let's go back to Albert because we started with him, um, and also sort of advance notice for the uh, for the next one in this series, which will be um, taming reviewer two and, and, and how to revise a paper.